It's really a little silly how excited I am about this topic. I have lots of notes. Hello, welcome or welcome back to Classics with a Quirk, where we talk about contemporary and luxury designer items and brands with a touch of silliness. This is the kind of content you find interesting. Please do like this video and subscribe for more of it. Thank you. I really enjoy finance and budgeting. It's kind of a weird thing to like maybe, but I do genuinely enjoy it. I've been budgeting since I was a wee tot. I have an old accounting ledger from when I was literally 11, when I made it my own like accounting system, like a savings category, a spending category, and a charity category. And like I diligently used that system. I, I was diligent like a long time. And I have just always had a love for finance. And so I wanted to talk about how I save and budget and specifically how I afford very expensive luxury items because I think that's probably what you came here for. Now I want to start off by saying that I am not acting as a financial advisor to anybody here. You are watching a video from me on the internet and I don't know you, I don't know your finances, I can't advise you personally financially because I am not acting as a financial advisor in this particular circumstance but I am just sharing my tips and tricks, my methods, and just stuff that works for me. I also want to say as a caveat that my methods might not work for you. They're kind of very detailed and I'm kind of very disciplined and what uh, works with me and my money might not work for you and your money, your budget, your lifestyle, whatever that may be. So take this with a grain of salt. Don't necessarily take it as like a buy the book, you have to do this to be successful because that's wrong just you know this is what i do and i'm gonna stop talking and start talking about what i actually do now now first thing i do need to say because this is very important when it comes to how i manage my money and why i'm able to manage the money in the way that i do is that i don't have debt and that is something that i know that i'm very privileged to be able to say but i don't have debt i don't have crushing horrible looming clouds of doom over me every time I make a purchase because I don't have debt. I made a lot of decisions when I was younger about how I was going to go to school and in what ways I was going to school and what I learned and where I learned it so I don't have student debt. I made a lot of decisions growing up to lead me to not have school debt and I'm very proud of those decisions even if like I kind of wish sometimes that I had taken other paths. I went to community college first. I didn't go to a fancy brand name school for my university levels, I went to community college, got my associates, transferred to a local university, finished out my degree, and that was my college experience. I also worked very, very hard throughout kind of my entire life, including college. I worked full time when I went to school, and that was very, very hard and very exhausting, and I did often sleep in my car, but that's another story. I just, you know, I really didn't want to have student debt hanging over my head. And I did a lot to make sure that it wouldn't happen. And I came from a place of privilege that I didn't go into it with debt. Like I wasn't escaping a bad situation, stuff like that, which often is why people get into student debts. I also wasn't shooting for a really specific college. I wasn't trying to be a doctor. Like a lot of the reasons that people get that noose around their neck in terms of debt didn't apply to me. So that's that's something. I also was very privileged in that I did have a family that we were not wealthy by any means, but my, my parents did give me my first car as a graduation gift when I was 18. It was a used car for $6,000 and I drove it until it broke. And you know, some people have to buy a car by themselves, buy a new vehicle, lease it, something, whatever. They, they have to deal with a car in some capacity and I didn't. I will say that I never got birthday presents growing up like I at 12 I told my parents that I'd rather the money be spent on other things for the household and I didn't need a birthday present so that's just kind of who I was as a very serious child and who I kind of grew up to be like I didn't need a birthday present and so I asked them not to give me any and so when I was 18 and I was graduating high school and going to community college so I could also work full-time while I went to community college my dad was like we, we got you a car happy birthday graduation for the last six years so that, you know, that, that happened and I'm very grateful for that, but I, I want to be upfront with how I came to where I am in terms of money with not having debt and not having to buy a car right off of the bat as soon as I graduated school. Also, I don't have any children and I don't want to have children. It is not a dream of mine to raise children. There is nothing wrong with children, obviously, like 
everybody was a child at some point. Like, I, I don't have anything against children. Children are great. They're fine. And some people are very fulfilled by being parents. I will not be. I do not want children. And I just, like, I will happily, you know, donate my money and donate my time and funds towards helping people who need to have help with their children as opposed to giving myself my own. You know, like I, I'm, I'm fine. Like I'm fine. Children are very expensive, and that has nothing to do with the fact that I don't want them. Like I don't want children. They're also very expensive, and the fact that I don't have children means that I can spend my money in other areas. I also already have like a very needy cat, so like, why would I need a baby? <laughs> anyway, back to money. I've been filming for 12 minutes. We like uh, let's let's hurry up. Okay. So back to money. There are a lot of different methods that people use to save money. Like there's the 50, 30, 20 rule. There's the rule of thirds that Cassie Thorpe just did a video about. Like Cassie Thorpe is great. Go follow her. She's awesome. I personally follow the pay yourself first method. And that method is paying yourself your investments, then paying your bills and expenses, and then having the leftover be your fun money your savings, whatever, for, for fun purchases. And so for me, that means that every time I earn anything, I earn income, I first put the income, before I pay my rent, a portion of that money goes into my investments, my long-term investments in my retirement account. I, I have those, by the way. Like I would recommend if you are earning money to do something for retirement and investment, like do, do that. Um, if you are in a job that has a 401k program, take advantage of that, please. Like take advantage of a 401k program, absolutely do that. If you are not part of a job that has a 401k, maybe you're self-employed, a Roth IRA is very good. Like do that, please, Roth IRA. I am self-employed, so I don't have a 401k to contribute to, but I do have a Roth IRA that I max out every single year. And I would say that that is one of the most important things that you can do once you start earning money is to start planning for your future. Like if you want to celebrate a big momentous occasion by buying yourself a luxury bag, like power to you, absolutely, good job. But also maybe consider saving some of that for future you or for needs, emergency expenses you. Like having money that you can access at some point when you need it is so important, is so important and that is probably the biggest advice. I'm not giving advice, but like if I was giving advice, like that's, that's, that's my advice. So I have my IRA and I have my mutual funds and my investments and all that stuff that I put money into every single paycheck, every single payment period, whatever that goes there first. That money is already spent automatically every single paycheck, whatever done. Then my remaining funds go towards paying my bills and expenses. And those don't really, change that drastically. Like my rent is the same every month. My internet bill is the same every month. I have an al allocated sum of money that I know will go towards gas, will go to groceries, will go to miscellaneous expenses, will go to charities. I budget my groceries. I make most of my own food. I very rarely eat out or dine in. I, I cook, you know, and I like knowing what my food is made of and where it comes from and I'm not a bad cook myself and I'm happy to eat what I make. So that saves me a lot of money not buying takeout. And generally also, I don't spend a lot on miscellaneous stuff. Like I'm not someone who will go shopping and just like buy makeup or buy shoes or buy clothes or buy hair care just for fun because I wanna buy something. I've never been that person. If I go shopping, I usually go with something in mind and I like browsing to see what else is there, but I usually only leave with the thing I went to get. And if I end up buying something that I didn't plan, it's usually something small like, oh, I went to TJ Maxx and I found some first aid beauty cream moisturizer for like $8 for 10 ounces and I need some of that anyway. I might as well buy it to stock up. Like it's not, big stuff. So my battery died and I had to stop recording to charge my camera. So I don't remember where I left off completely, but I'm gonna just try my best. I think I was talking about stuff I buy and stuff that I don't buy, which is like random kind of miscellaneous purchases that like are small things that kind of add up. I track every single one of my purchases. I keep my receipts. I log what I buy, where I bought it, when I bought it, how much it was. Sometimes I talk about like my feelings of why I purchased it at the time or like why I bought it or what it was for. I also take pictures of all of my receipts. Like I have a, 
app that I log them all into. I'm very particular about my money and where it goes, and that's for big stuff and for small stuff. Like if I go to a dollar store and I pick up something for a dollar, I do write that down. I do make a note of it in my notes and files and stuff, and then I do section off, I take a picture of that receipt, and I it like everything is something that is accounted for when it comes to how I manage my own money. And that's not something that works for everybody. I know some people who just like kind of put all the receipts in a basket and like tally it up at the end of the week or end of the month. There's some people who don't keep track of receipts. I personally think that the more you are aware of where your money goes, the better handle you have on your money and the easier it is to save if you know where it's supposed to be. So I would recommend if you are hoping to save money or save up for something big that you do pay attention to where all your funds go. And I'm not saying that if you don't buy a coffee every day or every week you're going to have a million dollars because that's kind of ridiculous. But if you spend say five dollars every day on coffee, you know, five times seven is thirty-five, that's thirty-five dollars a week on coffee. And if that's worth it to you to spend every single week, that's fine. But if you think about $35 a week being $35 a week, being $70 every two weeks, being $140 a month, then maybe it's worth it to you to not spend $140 one month and then have that for something else. Like it, it's a give and a take. It's a give and a take for what you're willing to not buy and what you're willing to spend money on. I just don't buy a lot of stuff. Like, as I said, I don't really eat out. I don't really get coffee drinks. Um, before the plague happened, I did often go to coffee shops to write and I would buy a beverage or buy a something and I would, you know, purchase something to be at the establishment, obviously, but certainly not now. So mm. as an example, and this is, this is kind of funny, but as an example, I, again, I keep a very detailed log of everything that I buy, right? In July of 2021, so you know, in, in July, I spent zero dollars on miscellaneous fund purchases. No money, nothing. I bought gas, I bought groceries, I bought like a technology thing that I needed to purchase for like functioning, but it wasn't like a fun splurge purchase, it was like a necessary thing that I had to buy. I bought nothing fun. I didn't buy makeup, I didn't buy a luxury item, I didn't buy a fragrance, I didn't, I didn't even buy like a random like snack because I would have categorized it as something else. Like I just I didn't spend any money on non-necessities. And that's not something that everybody can do. People like little luxuries. People like their coffee beverage or they like being able to buy a random eyeshadow palette. Like that's that's fine. It's just for me, I, I don't buy a lot of stuff. So, so it's easier for me to spend my money on bigger purchases because I have more of it because I'm not spending it on multiple small purchases. I'm kind of a minimalist in general, including in my luxury buying. I don't have a very big luxury collection. I am very careful with the bags I buy. I'm very meticulous in choosing what I purchase. Even my impulse buys are things that I tend to think about a lot and I will sometimes lose out on a purchase because I took too long to think about it and I think that's fine. I would rather not buy something I was uncertain about, then buy it and then have it and not want it as much as I think I, you know, like there's always FOMO, there's always the one that got away, but there's always something else to buy. So I don't worry as much about it. I made a video a while back about FOMO and about purchasing things because you are worried about, you know, the fear of missing out. And I'll link that video because it's an interesting one. I think it's a discussion that's worth having, but I tend to, not buy things I don't need. And when it comes to luxury, which nobody needs, I am very careful with what I buy. I don't believe in consuming for the sake of consuming. And I like fashion and I like style and I like stuff like that, but I'm not great at it. So if I buy something, it's because I really genuinely love it and want to keep it and use it for a very, very long time. I'm not somebody that can like rotate pieces out and, and stuff like that. I, I just, I just don't have the capacity to do that. I'm not creative enough to do that. Like people who are buying a bag a week or every month or something like, I mean, power to them. I personally, that's not sustainable for me, first of all. And second of all, I don't want to do something like that. For me, when I make a big luxury purchase, it's special. It's nice. It's something that I really enjoy having been able to accomplish and get. And for some people, you know, luxury is their hobby. You know, they, they buy a bag a week or they rotate bags in and out and cool, good, good job. 
I I can't imagine though for, for me personally buying a bag and then being like okay I bought it it's on my shelf now what's the next piece to get I have a wish list like probably a lot of us have wish lists but I'm not constantly looking for the next thing to buy I like taking my time with my decisions and I also only have so much space I don't need a I don't need to build myself a new house to have a special closet to house a growing collection. I'm fine with what I have and I think that's a mindset that's benefited me in buying expensive things because I'm not worried about overspending my means or buying too much or not being able to appreciate what I have. I think it's important as someone who consumes items of any kind but who also consumes very expensive things that I should really enjoy what I have and not not be overtaken by hype or overtaken by the next big thing because everybody else wants it. If everybody else wants something and I look at it and I see see it and I end up liking it, like yeah, of course. But I'm not really a big trend bag buyer or a big trend fashion anything, honestly. <laughs> this is a little bit of a diversion from money, but it's a mindset that I have that I think is kind of one of the reasons I'm able to buy the things that I do is that I am careful and I'm cognizant of what I can and can't purchase, but also I don't want a collection of 80 bags or 40 bags. I would always like to get more beautiful things that I think are beautiful and are made well and are fun to touch. And there's nothing wrong with having a 40 bag collection or an 80 bag collection if that's what works for you. There's a lot of YouTubers that I personally follow who have huge collections and who have beautiful collections and it works great for them and for their fashion and I think that's super cool. And in some ways I sort of wish that was me, not that I wish that I had what they have, but I wish that I had the creativity to be able to style and wear so many different things in so many cool ways. Like Cassie Thorpe's style is really, really cool. Morgan Britt Butler has such a fun, fun, colorful aesthetic. Dale from Dale's Addiction, she has a really cool like done but undone style is what she calls it. And they're all creative in how they express themselves. And I like fashion and I like fashion as art, but I haven't yet completely gotten to the point of being able to utilize it in all the ways that I'd like to. So I think that for me consuming things when I can't like follow through doesn't make any sense. I, I don't like it. I, I'm kind of babbling at this point but it's like I just don't consume to consume and that helps me save money because if you're not consuming to consume you're not buying random stuff for no reason or just to have it. There's definitely things I've bought because I want to have it but I think there are limits. I think there's there are reasonable limits, at least for me, that, you know, I might have a bag collection of a lot of bags one day if I had the space and the money for it. I could see that. I think it'd be really fun. But I don't need it because we don't need any of this stuff. And so I have other things that I prioritize. Now to get back to money talk, I also never ever in this kind of makes sense considering what I just said, but I never buy anything that I can't afford. If I cannot pay for it out of pocket with cash, like right away from my bank account in some capacity, I can't afford it. And so I don't buy it. I don't buy anything on credit at all. I don't want debt. I don't have debt. I don't want debt. So I don't buy anything on credit. That is not to say that I don't buy things with credit cards, because I do. I pay all my bills with credit cards. I buy all my necessities with credit cards. I buy anything fun with a credit card because you need credit in this day and age. It's impossible to really get by without positive credit. And for some people, that's really hard to do. And I also understand that, again, I'm coming from a place of privilege. There are people that need to put things on credit like necessities and they're in debt and that's something that's really hard to escape. It's really easy to stay poor if you are poor and to get poor and to have negative funds if you are in a debt pit and that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about someone who has money and is supposed to be responsible with it. Like I will pay things on a credit card, I will get that credit, I will also get that cash back and then I will pay it off. So I have several different credit cards. I think I have four. Yeah, I have four credit cards. 
all of them are some sort of cashback program, I get a minimum of one and a half cash back on any purchase I make, period. But I usually get 2% or 3%, if not more. And I will not buy something unless I'm getting at least one and a half percent cash back on it. Because it's free money. There's no reason not to use credit cards and get cash back. It's free money. And I've actually bought some things with cash back. I funded an entire trip to Japan once with cash back from a credit card that was just like, I was funneling it into the credit card and I was funneling it into it. And then I bought my plane tickets and I bought my Airbnb and everything with just my cash back earnings, like free money. So especially if you're buying a big thing, if you can afford the big thing, pay for it with a credit card that has good cash back, get that cash back and then have free money with the big purchase. Like. As long as you're responsible with it, credit cards are a really good way to transact business, however you want to say it. If you are responsible enough and you're in a place that you can, credit cards are really the best way to transact because you get something back and also it helps you build your credit score and I, I, I hate to be the bearer of bad news for people who don't believe in or don't like credit cards, but you need a good credit score not giving financial advice. I'm not giving financial advice, but you, 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 you do. If you want to buy a car, if you want to buy a house, if you want to get a loan from the bank for a business venture, you need good credit. It's kind of like just a, a, a truth of our society. We, we don't have a barter system unless you, you know, live in a small town where you can barter. My mom barters a lot, but like we, we, credit is important. So it's important to build good credit. And I'm not talking about buying thousands of dollars worth of bags. I'm like, if you have a credit card that you have like a small limit on and you pay for your gas every month with just that, and that helps you build credit, like please build credit, <laughs> please, please build credit properly. And, and, and obviously don't misuse it if you don't have to, but credit's important. And I'm not talking about like Klarna, that's something else, but like actual credit cards, like Visa, MasterCard, Discover, like credit's important. Moving on. This is going to be such a long rambly video. Okay. So I've talked about paying myself first with investments and future proofing my life. I've talked about paying bills and expenses. So I have leftover money after I've paid my bills and expenses because I don't live paycheck to paycheck. I have extra after I'm done putting investment money down and paying my bills. Okay. So extra money. What do I do with that? Well, I allocate that money into a variety of savings funds. And I have one savings account. Well, I have multiple, but like I have one main savings account that is like my first level savings account. And that's a high yield, high yield bank account that gives me interest every month. And I'm not talking about like 0.006% interest. I'm talking about like reasonable amounts of interest, like dollars, not fractions of a penny. Not giving financial advice, but high yield savings account, please, please high yield savings account. Anyway. Um, if you would like just like general finance videos, by the way, like, please let me know. I'd be happy to make more videos about this or about like other finances in general, savings, how IRAs work, like all that stuff is stuff I really like and I'm interested in. And I'm not acting as a financial advisor to you personally, but I, you know, like it. It's an interest. So just, you know, let me know in the comments down below if you'd like more videos like that. So. I am going to try to keep onto the topic too late, but in terms of my savings account, I have one high yield savings account and then I have a spreadsheet that I've made myself where I section off the amounts of money within it. So say that savings account has like $10,000. I have a spreadsheet that says $5,000 of that is for this, 1,000 is for this, 1,000 is for this, 2,000 is for this, etc. And so my sections, my money pots change depending on what I want money to be allocated for. But I generally have five different sections. I have my general savings fund, which is fund for emergencies, funds for if I have a job crisis, funds for a lack of income suddenly for some reason. And that is a set amount of money that I have allocated into that fund that is not touched unless I have said emergency. And then after I use it for the emergency, I replenish it back up and build it back up and then keep it at that level again. So a lot of people recommend like having at least $1,000 or 1,000 pounds or whatever, like in your currency of emergency money. I have more than that, but I have a set amount of emergency money in my fund account in my general savings pot. Then I have my book money fund. 
my book money fund is money that I make from, you know, my streams of income and I put into my fund to allocate towards things for books. So buying covers, paying cover artists, paying for translations into other languages, paying for marketing, paying for editing and proofreading if I hire an outside editor or proofer, stuff like that. That is my book money fund. And so I allocate part of my income into putting back into my business, my writing business. So that's, that's that. Then I have travel. I love to travel. I haven't been able to do a lot of it recently. Most of us haven't been able to do a lot of it recently. And that's just how things are right now, but I still have a travel fund and I am building it up for when eventually I am able to travel again safely and not put other people at risk or put myself in danger. So I have a travel fund and I just push money into that. And I've been putting money into that for a while. So it's big ish and that's nice. And I have that as a general travel fund. So that pays for plane tickets or hotels, um, meals, any transportation, like, you know, trains or planes or boats in the area I'm going, stuff like that. I also currently have a separate travel fund. So I have my general travel fund and then a separate travel fund for specifically Japan because I'm planning on going there soon. It's the next destination that I have in mind. And so I have some things that I specifically want to do in Japan. So I'm just putting that into a special Japanese only savings pool. So like Japan is this, this pot right here. And then other travel and impromptu travel is like this pot right here. Like if I want to go to, I don't know, Iceland or Italy or Canada, like separate pun. So, so, so we've got four so far, right? Then I have big fun money. So big fun money is like my savings pot for very expensive purchases. We're talking thousands of dollars as opposed to a couple hundred dollars. So big fun money is I have a bag in mind, for instance, I have a specific bag in mind and that bag is $4,000. I put a portion of my excess money into everything and some of that goes into my big fun money account. And then once I reach that $4,000 mark, I have enough money and big fun money to buy the, the bag. So that is how I really save for specific big ticket items is I have my big fun money pot and then I just like squirrel money into that until I'm ready to buy the thing. I will say that I don't always have a specific item in mind in my big fun money pot. Sometimes it's just, I have a lot of money here. I'm going to want to buy something anyway. And that's this way I have enough money to buy it whenever I find the thing I want to buy. So it's nice to have it kind of already allocated so that I can use it at my discretion whenever I want to, as opposed to having to try to come up with the money when I find something that I want. In the same vein, I have small fun money, which is smaller amounts of money for smaller purchases. So say I want to buy like new clothes or shoes or a fragrance, something that's not an extravagant amount of money, but still is like, you know, a hundred, two hundred dollars, something like that. Or say I want to buy a new piece of technology or a camera that's coming from small fun money. Are you okay? Oh my, Mew Mew. Where was I? This is such a ridiculous video. I don't even know where I am. So yes, uh, I think I was talking about small fun money. So like small fun. So say I want to buy a new fragrance or more recently, um, I'm trying to get into makeup. I have not done makeup for a very long time, but it's something that I am interested in. I really like what people can do with makeup. I think it's so fun and cool and interesting and I am not brave. So that's something that I would like to dabble in and so it's something I would like to invest in. So small fun money would be like a makeup purchase or something like that. I, I'm over explaining it. You understand the gist. Finally, I have like my random category. So if I'm saving for something in particular, particular, like a birthday present or something, uh, this year I had like a birthday fund going. So I was putting money into my birthday fund. So when I eventually found something I wanted to buy, I had it there ready for me to pull from. I also had a moving fund because, you know, when I moved, I knew that I was going to buy some more furniture when I got to my new place. I did end up needing to buy a whole new bed. That was a fun time. And so I was able to use money from my moving fund to, to purchase all these things. And again, this is all just like, it's all made up. All of it's made up. Like I don't have eight different savings accounts. I have one account and a spreadsheet that just portions everything out the way I want it to be. If there was an emergency and I had to use the money in my book fund money, it's not 
only able to be used for book money even if there's an emergency and I need it. Like, I can pull that money. I have it. It's it's there. The the, the lines are are, are are fake. It's it's all made up. It's invisible. But I do portion them out in my brain. It is really hard for me to like cross that line and use it for something besides what I've designated it for because I've just been doing it for such a long time and I'm disciplined enough to be able to do that. I don't say, oh, that bag is beautiful. I don't have enough in my fun money though. I'm going to dip into my book fun money or I'm going to dip into my ex emergency savings. Like that doesn't, that, that, that's not allowed. And I'm able to say that's not allowed and then I don't do it. A lot of this comes from just being disciplined and knowing how money works and like the value of money to me, which is a lot and it's security and stability and it's taking care of the future and taking care of other people. Like another key for me is keeping very good records. As I said before, I track everything. I keep track of all of my receipts. I know exactly where my money is going and when it's going and why it's going. So that's part of it too, in terms of my overall big budget picture. I've always been this way about money and I know it probably sounds like a little bit over the top in terms of how I am maybe like I don't know maybe you're the same way like if you are please let me know I would love to know that I'm not alone in this but I just I like this it's fun to me it doesn't feel stressful because it's not stressful for me like keeping track of all this stuff is like enjoyable and I know that's very strange but it is and I also know that that's unusual and <laughs> that's fine I think I've covered everything I think that I've covered everything more than thoroughly and I think I need to stop talking because Clearly this is a topic I'm passionate about. I'm willing to tell you much more about it if you so choose. Please leave me a comment down below if there's something else you want me to discuss or in another video, something like that. But like, that, that, that that's it. That's how I manage my money. That's why I'm able to afford the things that I do. That's all the other extenuating circumstances that go into how I personally, me as the one individual, am able to do things that I do and make the choices I make. And that's it. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know if this was particularly helpful, but I hope that it was at least entertaining. And if you like this video, please do give it a like because it super duper helps the algorithm and subscribe for more content because it helps the algorithm even more. Thank you so much for watching and I'll see you next time. Bye.